Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day three of WASD here at the PC Games End Theatre. And uh, the next session is going to be about post-pandemic working methods uh, and flexible working methods in general. And we're um, uh, glad to have Joe Brammer, the CEO of Bulkhead, with us to talk about uh, a particular experiment that his studio has been running um, on the four-day work week. Uh, but I will let our panelists introduce themselves. Uh, so to my left. Uh, I'm Joe. I'm the CEO or studio lead of Bulkhead. And, um recently gone through a bit of an identity crisis and decided that we wanted to stay indie, but also try and do AAA better. So we decided to do a four-day work week and focus on our staff. Hi, everyone. My name is Adam. I'm one of the co-founders of Beta Jester. We're a work for hire and game studio uh, in the north of England. I'm also the co-founder of uh, Game Dev London, the community of game developers in and outside of London. Lovely. All right. Thanks, guys. So um, I think we'll start maybe, I mean, obviously, the, the purpose of this, this, this panel is to talk about um, the fact that the pandemic has forced change in the way that you know companies across the country have have had to work, um, but including and especially in game dev and like the particular challenges around that. Um, but also, I want to sort of broaden the context and say, you know, has it forced some urgent questions about the way that we were working anyway that are uh, you know we're always um, worth considering. Um, so. I know we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about the four-day work week specifically in a sec, but outside of that, um, I thought we could maybe start by having you guys talk about the other measures that you guys have recently adopted, um, if any, on flexible working, anything that's unconventional outside the usual nine to five. Um, yeah, to you. I mean, so from my perspective, um, my studio has always been pretty uh, loose in terms of we, we have a sort of a vague structure of like, you know, we work Monday, Friday, and that kind of thing. But we've always kind of taken it as people can kind of judge what works best for them. Uh, and certainly pre-pandemic, it was a case of, we, while we were in the office more frequently, there were some times when, for example, for a, I, I moved away from the office for a while, and I was only going uh, into the office once a week. Um, but my hours were never like, you must, you know, we, we weren't bothered by presenteeism. and we weren't like, you must be there at nine, you must leave at five, and if you haven't finished your work, carry on doing. And I think particularly from our perspective, that fit who we were as people quite accurately. And I think if anything with the pandemic, what that's brought out is people are more aware of themselves and how they need their working conditions to be. Mm. Because a lot of the time you just kind of go, oh, it's nine to five, that's it. Whereas this, because people have had to work from home and there was a bit more, actually what would work better for me? Would it be work better to start a bit later or to finish a bit earlier or, or how is it gonna work? That's been one of the key things from, from my company's perspective that uh, not only was the case before, but certainly coming out of the pandemic, lots more people are aware of. I think it's, it's, um, you know, it's caveat it. Like, I work fine from home. I like it. I get work done. But I also like socializing with people at the office. I think ultimately um, it was really easy, or people were very afraid to go and talk about the negatives of it, because it, it is great, and there are lots of benefits. But um, I remember seeing on Facebook a lot of comments from friends, different industries, saying, like, oh, you know, that job they said you couldn't do from home, you can. Mm -hmm. And it's a sort of gross misunderstanding of what you're doing in your job. In the, um, I've always been a big advocate for sort of games are made by teams, not people kind of thing. Like it's, it's, you know, they can, they can have 10 great devs, but you've really, they've got to pull together. So, you know, you'd see like, um, oh, we're all working at home fine, it's working great. And it kind of felt like everyone was moving up like this instead of sort of towards the same goal and they were sort of fanning out a bit more. So we've had to work quite hard to kind of, um, there's a lot more meetings across the, <laughs> we, we didn't really have a lot of meetings ever and now you have to, to just keep knocking back on track. So in, in theory, you, you can do it from home and it works fine, but it's, um, it doesn't mean there's not negatives and new challenges. and. Um, I think the better studios who've, who've done it or executed it better, uh, their people have acknowledged that there are challenges to it, and um, it's great being able to do the dishes. That's a cool thing, but um, ultimately, uh, you know, I think a lot of people have found it harder than they realize to separate work and home. A pet peeve of mine is when you see um, someone in a call, or worse, leading a meeting, and they have a child on their lap or strapped to them, or they're bouncing it. And like you are either doing childcare or you are parenting uh, or you are working, sorry, and, and um, that's a really hard one to split. And I know a lot of other people in sort of my position feel the same. It's just it's very difficult to tell them that, like put yeah. your child down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there's there's lots of. I mean, we had a, we had a panel a couple of days ago where um, someone mentioned that actually, you know, we 
those assumptions that you mentioned probably were correct. Like, we, we, you, game devs couldn't have done this job from home 10 years ago or so. Um, so, I mean, technology plays a, a role in that. Like, everything's in the cloud these days. Um, internet connections are so much better that they can handle the asset sizes that you guys need to. Um, but, you know, you're the experts here. Like, uh, uh, what, what challenges particular to a game studio has the pandemic thrown up that you are able or, or not able to navigate? I think it depends on what game you're working on, right? Like, you're doing co-development stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if you're working with a massive IP, then a lot of those contracts are saying you can't take the game home. And, mm -hmm. um, or they're saying, uh, you know, if you work with Xbox, you, you're not allowed to just take the Xbox to your house and just work. Like, I think the contracts usually say you have to have dimmed windows, a certain security system. We never have, but <laughs> you're supposed to. Um, and, uh, you know, there's all those kind of things that are like, these obstacles you have to get around and, and achieve. And um, it, it is so bespoke to each situation. But as a co-development team, you know, whereas we've worked on mostly our own stuff, like it must have been really difficult, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. There's been a lot of bouncing around and trying to figure out how do we, especially for us, we're having lots of, of clients and that kind of thing. How do we communicate in this new world? There's no going and, you know, we'll go catch up with you here or we'll meet up with you there. It's been a lot of trying to connect. It's exactly like you said, you're just meetings on meetings on meetings, and that changes the kind of the communication between you and the people you work with and your clients and how you try and keep everything kind of on, on, on a level. I think certainly in terms of challenges that it's thrown up, one of the big ones for us is that, um, and it's kind of what you were saying before, that working from home presents a very, it, it's, it's, it was not even the working from home, it was the continuous working from home, it was the lack of ability to escape that kind of space and go to an office or go to somewhere else that meant a lot of people were facing challenges with uh, their mental health or understandings. Uh, for a lot of people, there were sort of things coming out like uh, from a neurodiversity perspective and trying to figure out who they were in, that, in this new space that people hadn't had to confront before because before it was just go to the office, work, come home, work, go home. And now it's like there's that lack, you talk about the lack of split between work and home really brought home to people that there was, that the, unless you had very well defined like this is my work life, this is my home life, it's very easy to blend and that caused people a lot of problems. Did, did, how much, did you grow over lockdown as a studio? Uh, so we had had somebody, we'd, we'd had one person in our studio who had been with us for, I think, four months before lockdown started, and now he's been with us for two years and four months. So he grew as part of our team purely remotely, basically. Um, I, I, sorry, I'm wondering, I mean, like, size. Yeah, how many people did you have in your team before uh, lockdown and after? So we had, uh, so we he was, so we were originally three, uh, three. we had him four months before the pandemic. We stayed as four. And the reason, what we did is change tactic. We kind of dropped some of our internal projects to focus purely work for hire, because when the pandemic started, we didn't know where we were going to end up, and we weren't sure if, without the events, without being able to pitch and publish it, then it was all going to be right. We wanted to secure kind of the long form stability. So we, that changed our entire kind of direction short term, and we've kind of gone back to where we were before now. But certainly, it was, there was a, a struggle point where we were like, we can't, we have to go just purely stability to make sure that we can yeah. get through this. I guess the reason I asked, sorry to steal your. No, no, but he's um, <laughs> But uh, it was <laughs> good. So we, we grew from uh, 50 people to 100. Wow. in the lockdown. Wow. Um, yeah. we, we grew. <laughs> yeah, you know, again, yeah. Time, yeah. And, um, you know, I remember saying to my mum, like, I've basically got a new job, and she was like, <laughs> didn't get it. Like, <laughs> like, I was doing very different things. And I think in that time, um, they wouldn't mind me saying, you know, we had, like, uh, we'd gone from a 50-person indie studio, we'd changed sort of owners in that time. And um, I think we had a suicide attempts. We had... Um, mental health across the board, um, people not knowing they have mental health issues, mm -hmm. um, sometimes our senior people included. And um, yeah, it was like all these things, I was like, oh my God, I'm just an indie game developer, what are we dealing with? Um, and you kind of said the same before we started, and um, how you react to that on, online and it was, it's completely different. And all of a sudden yeah. you're not spotting someone, we spotted someone, um, they just stopped coming to work with their webcam on. And then we kind of said, you know, yeah. put your webcam on, you turn it behind him, he's got his bedroom's a mess and he's got a black eye and you're like... We, we had some really useful conversations um, and, and, and we, we brought in some, some consultants over lockdown to sort of talk about, um, you know, things like, you know, mental health issues and like warning signs, things to look for, like if someone's, you know, energy is low in meetings or, and, you know, they're, just, they're consistent, like things like that and they're, you know, showing up late or whatever, you know, you, you, there are these little things that you have to be more proactive about spotting to sort of see that something's going on because like... You know, people don't feel 
confident necessarily to come out and, and recognize it, and they may not even recognize it themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, there's a ton of you know um, HR questions that it's all thrown up, as well as technical challenges. Um, I guess then, I mean, because because part of it is the environment. Some people know they like coming into an office. Some people know they prefer working from home. We've shifted to a little bit of a hybrid model. Um, is there an obligation there? Do you think for uh, indies who or, or developers who previously had offices to retain them for some sort of to offer that kind of facility or functionality? What or, 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 or can it be possible to work entirely from home? Because I mean, plenty of studios do. But. So um, from our perspective, obviously, we're fortunate in being such a small studio. We were able to transition basically to fully remote and, and have now stayed fully remote um, just because we, none of us live near where the office was anymore. People moved over the pandemic. And the, for us, though, and I'm conscious of this, we have one client where um, we go into their office every now and then to do some of pieces. And the benefits of being in the same room and bouncing ideas off each other are absolutely tangible. Not that we can't do the work fully remotely, um, but it's as, as Joe was saying, sometimes you know, if you're not, it's it's not just people. It's also about teams, and teams work really well when they're together. And we do try and recreate that. You know, we use services like Discord to try and like have voice chats and be in and amongst each other. But for me, I would always want to have access to spaces. And we're moving into that kind of world where that's possible. You know, with accelerators and uh, hot desking spaces where you can book rooms and get together and do stuff like that. If I was mm -hmm. going, and I've tried to have like larger meetings as a group uh, over the period and it's just it's not got the same kind of energy you're not bouncing off each other in the same way as opposed to in your room and ex ex exactly just to your point that some people some people feel like oh i just want to be fully remote and that's absolutely fine i understand that but i also feel like sometimes people do you know that's why there are things like team building that's why there are all these kind of social entertainment games are doing really well because sometimes people need to be together to really understand each other and click in that way yeah i think meetings became more like a tv show where you, have, you never never notice but on a tv show no one ever talks over each other yeah and that sometimes like you know we always want people to be heard but sometimes the flow of a conversation is that you will block people and talk over each other and you know and when you know each other well you can do that and that was gone basically um because you've got that minor delay when you're talking as well and mm -hmm. but i think you said something that kind of stuck with me that um i'll probably get chastised for saying this but it you know you said like oh people know if they want to work at home or what suits them um i don't think they all do i think some people do but um in fact, I'm positive, and I know for a fact, that they all don't know what is necessarily best for them. We've got some really young people that are like, um, let's take an example of a really young gamer who's been a gamer yeah. his whole life, more than happy to stay at home and um, play video games on a weekend. So now this person that thinks they're really happy because they're staying at home playing games, they're not having to travel or commute, uh, they're not spending money on petrol or trains or whatever, um, they can eat food at home, they're never going outside. I think, I think that's a fair counterpoint. Like, if you've got people who are like, hired straight out of uni and haven't really had contact with a, a proper office environment, a dedicated office one, yeah, they, they, they have no frame of reference, so they don't know. Yeah. And e but even as simple as, like, um, they had to leave their house to walk to the office, no, you know, no cost required, but it's raining and it's cold. Like, well, hang on, that's part of, like, your experience, is the human experience yeah. is going out and dealing yeah. with that and going and, like... Vitamin D and... Yeah, yeah. like, and they, they, that those people that you kind of say like, okay, we'll just go for a walk instead. And they're like, why? Like, and you're like, because you're really fucking unhealthy. Yeah. That's why, like, yeah. go outside. Um, and, you know, it's, that's not just juniors either. There's a lot of people that, um, you know, it's not, not necessarily what they value. Um, and, and that, um, oh, I know what's best for me kind of thing is, um, I believe you know what you want to do. <laughs> I don't think, like, I don't know what's best for me. I have shit food all the time. Um, <laughs> but I know it's shit foods, and I'm eating it because I'm fine with that. But um, I pay the penalties in 30 years. Mm. But I think the, the immediate penalties of, of some of these decisions that people were making um, or not making routines they were slipping into were, were really punishing to them really quickly. Um, and whilst they may have, I, I remember the productivity when we got home, I remember productivity being actually, it was higher because people were working a bit longer. And they were, you know, that was fine. And for about a month, it was really good. And then I think it's standard human nature. I think everyone, and if you say you don't do this, you're fucking lying. Mm -hmm. um, they've found out what you can get away with, or, oh, I could sleep in a little bit later here and do this, or I could stop here. Or, oh, I'll, I remember someone saying to me, like, um, oh, yeah, I love being at home because uh, I can just uh, see my kids more in the day and just, like, help out my wife looking after them. I'm like, how? 
you're at work. <laughs> it doesn't add, I, no, I understand if your wife's gone to the toilet or your, your husband's gone to the toilet and you look after the kid for a bit, but you shouldn't be daycare. That's not how that works. And um, there's a few things like that where uh, or someone was like, oh, I've got the builders in today. They're knocking down this window, so everything's really loud. I'm like, so how are you working? If you, <laughs> that doesn't sound right. And um, there are, the, the, we have seen, I mean, domestic disrupt, uh, disruptions are, are that, cause like, you know, it's a, it's a different environment from an office, and like, I don't think, I mean, it's, it is tough to get around that. What, what solutions would you guys propose, guys propose to this? Um, I mean, in particular, sort of coming off the back of that point, I think a big thing that people, when they came off of sort of going into the office and went straight into work from home, a lot of people just dive straight into it and just thought, oh, I'll just carry on working. Exactly that, that first month, people were just like, running on the energy of just like, oh, we'll make this work. And I think a huge part of it is that people did not have structures in place. Then that more so than going into the office where, you know, there's this very rigid, okay, I have left the front door. I am now walking to the thing. Your mind is already set up for that. Mm. Without those structures, it's very easy to slip into uh, kind of a, a blurry gray space of like, am I working? Am I not working? Uh, how do I get more productive? Am I, am I focusing on my work right now or am I slipping into social media? Am I being distracted? Um, and certainly that was something that, that I kind of I experienced in that period, especially sort of by the time I hit sort of four to six months in, I was aware that like even my own practice, and I've, I've been running the company at that point for five years, I was slipping in terms of productivity. And, that, and for me personally, that, came, that was coming from a, a neurodivergent perspective, which I just didn't know about. So I recently was diagnosed with ADHD. But that was something I didn't know before, and that only came through because I didn't have structures in place, and then I was forced to kind of put those, put those in. And if you don't have the wherewithal to be aware of that, you won't put those structures in and it's too easy to slip into, I'm mm. just doing this, I'm just doing that, I'm just going over here, I'm just, you know, and, and not be able to focus on that properly. Whereas now, the good thing now is a bit like you were talking about, you had the person come in and talk to you about all these things and, and build that, yeah. is that the more people can start to build in more rigid structures, like, okay, I will get up at this time, I'll sit down once I'm on the computer, the door, you know, door shuts and that's what I'm focusing on, or I'll log into a different account with everything I've installed and, and focus on this, or today I am going into the office and then it has that separation. That allows more of a working structure to be built in and, makes, and brings back some of that sense of how to be productive and how to be focused. But as to your point, especially people who are coming from, have never been in that environment, who've come through the pandemic straight into trying to work and work from home, it's they people do have to reflect on is this the best way I can do it and even when it's, it's to that point about like why would I go for a walk people don't even think about it they just kind of mm. slipped into I'm just doing what I'm doing and actually it's good to take a step back and reflect on your setup and go is this the best way for me to be the most productive and, the, and to work the best way that I can yeah because they will start to blame the games and the systems around them as well straight away like everyone looks to lash out like oh, I'm miserable at the moment, oh, it's because the game, this is really hard, development, or oh, I don't like this producer, or I don't like this. But, like, uh, I've one thing, our solution to a lot of it, and it's not like we've solved it, like, to be clear, we don't, we don't really know, <laughs> um, but was sort of communication with people and, like, yeah. critically um, challenging them. Uh, you know, why do you want to work from home? What's the reason? Because working from home is fine. Like, you can do it. But why do you want it? Because it might be that, look, I just spend too much money on petrol and I just save loads of money. I think I was, we had a junior say that, and I was like, so if we gave you a raise, you'd come to the office? And he was like, I think, yeah, because I like being in the office. And I was like, okay. So the issue is money. It's not you want to work from home. Um, so finding those, like, um, it needs another raise again now, but finding <laughs> those issues, like, you know, actually boiling down to it, I think that's the important bit because some people are like, I want to work from home because I hate the commute and I get, um, I'm now home pretty much straight away and I get to you know, be with my kids and go swimming with them, that kind of thing. Like it, that's like, yeah, that, I can see why that makes sense. But there are other people who um, actually really like the office culture and want yeah. to be there, but it, it, the benefits do not outweigh the negatives. So um, all the benefits of being in the office don't outweigh the benefits of uh, working from home. Um, which is sad, really. So I think, you know, hybrid's obviously great um, compared to you guys. Like, as devs, we need massive PCs with a m mountain of security and loads of screens, and it, it is really difficult. We recently started using Parsec, um, yeah, yeah. which is really, really good. <laughs> like, it is. It's, it's tough to play games on because there's a lot of lag, <laughs> depending on the connection. Yeah. But yeah, we, we, we use it to sort of do press previews occasionally. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's been a great discussion so far. Lots of good points. But there's some comments on our Twitch. 
Hi guys, um, uh, saying they love it. Um, I want to get on to the four day work week. Um, you've been running it in your studio. You, you uh, solicited some feedback uh, from your staff on how it's been going so far. Um, uh, tell us about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can ask a more specific question if you yeah, like. No, that's fine. I mean, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's an annoying one because we're kind of, we're probably the biggest studio in the UK to do it at this point. There's quite a few, like, I have no doubt that a 10-person studio can do a four-day work week. That's, of course they fucking can. Like, but 100 people is very, very different. Um, mm. And I think, um, so we've been doing it for sort of three months now um, on a trial, and it's been interesting, because I want it to work right. The whole, it all came from like me and a business partner kind of thing. We are running the company, and one of our dreams was we just want to work four days a week. We don't want to work five. As we've got bigger, we've basically worked six, so we're going to go the way. Um, so we were kind of like, well, what if we just gave everyone that? That would give us more time because there's less stuff to do with their issues kind of thing. Um, and basically, we, we, um, we actually don't buy into the whole, oh, it makes you more productive. That I just think it's bullshit. Um, <laughs> any, the, there's an alarming lack of research on a four-day work week. There's a lot of stuff out there but it's propaganda. It's people who want this to happen writing it from a biased perspective. It doesn't mean it's not the right thing. We think we were, we were trying to go down to 90% productivity from 100, obviously. Um, we said, if we can remain mostly productive, um, then it's fine. We'll be less productive overall, but you know, you can argue we're going to hire more people. Um, your staff will be happier to come in on a Monday. They'll have a bit more time to rest. There is a benefit to that. It doesn't make up an entire day of not working. <laughs> But um, that was kind of our expectation. And like, to be honest, we're probably at 80% productivity. That is probably what's happening. We made a few changes and we tried to get this kind of mentality of like, you need to be, we need to do more work in the day kind of thing. And it, it, we're just struggling to really do that. It doesn't mean that the 40 work week isn't necessarily the right thing for us, for the world, for the economy, for, you know, it might just be, all right, we're less productive than we were before. But the really interesting thing we saw is with, there are two teams, one that inherently work on a bigger AAA game that's a lot slower, and one that works on a, a sort of internal bulkhead game that's um, a lot faster. The faster guys were just like, yeah, we're slower. We are a day slower. The slower team with the bigger game were like, didn't notice anything. Right, <laughs> Did, okay. Because their Fridays were very fair, like light, and I, we also didn't look at five days, originally look at five days of um, the week as like every day is, has equal value. Like Friday does have a lower value. People are t more tired, they're slowing down. Friday afternoons are pretty much a throwaway for a lot of companies, I think. Um, so it carries less weight that day anyway. But ultimately, it depends how fast your team is. Do you want, can you afford to slow down? Do you need to speed up? Like, it's kind of a takeaway. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, we've, probably all seen um, articles coming out about companies and, and in, in, in the entire sort of US states and countries that have like been try, trialing a four day work week and they say, you know, actually it, it raises productivity. There is something a little bit counterintuitive about that. So it's interesting to hear your experience. Um, Adam, what do, you, what do you reckon about, I mean, what's your understanding of um, the thinking around four day work weeks right now and what's your response to uh, Joe's experience? I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly that. It's the fact that we're trying, people are trying to figure out, does it make people productive? Is it just useful? Is it helpful? How's it going to end up? And there is that sense of, like, on the one hand, you're going, <coughs> you're losing a day, so how can it be more productive? But on the other hand, there is, there's an idea of the idea that it's like, well, if you can use that day to do other things, to prep your world, to you know, take things off your mind, to unload it, can you get more work done in the rest of the week? And it is, it's early days, exactly. It's that we don't, we don't know yet. Um, and it's good there are companies like Bulkhead trying it out and sort of like, well, where, where does it land? Does it, and mm. even if it doesn't make it more productive, does it make it better just overall for people or people have whatever it might be? Um, for me, certainly, there's been a sense of any kind of companies having flex as opposed to being very rigid in sort of the nine to five has definitely seen uh, making life easier for people. You know, if they need to start just a little bit later, a little bit later and then finish a bit later just because of life or whatever it might be, it's that improving mentalities and improving sort of mental and, and making people feel a bit more free and open in the space does make people more productive. Happier people are more productive. That's just sort of a natural way of things. Um, I think there's a lot of potential to the four-day week. I think there's a lot of opportunity and I think, uh, but it's exactly like that. There needs to be the research behind it to go, and there's this value to it that's going to make it work. It's great to see more companies trying it out, 
Um, it's something that I've been considering sort of suggesting. We're not doing it right now, but it's something that I'm thinking about um, because I want to, ultimately for me, it's more about I want to question things that are set up to go, actually, is there a better way we can do this? Um, and better could mean anything. It could mean a whole bunch of reasons why. But ultimately, if it, if it brings good into the company one way or another, then maybe it's worth doing. And I think right now, there's some evidence to support that. It's not, we're not 100%. We don't know exactly yet, but that's why we're, you know, it's being trialed and big companies can turn around and go, here's what we found. Yeah, productivity absolutely isn't everything. And like, you know, the, the gains in, in well-being, um, I presumably, you know, it's a hugely attractive perk. So like the company could benefit from talented staff, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, I think it's, it, it's, uh, it's a fascinating experiment. Um, right, I think we sort of run down on all the, the, the questions that I kind of had. What, what are the, um, what other sort of arrangements or issues uh, thrown up by, you know, flexible working arrangements or by the pandemic? Um, uh, might we not have discussed that uh, you'd like to sort of highlight if there's anything? Otherwise, we can go to questions. Um, I think there's kind of a there's almost like a little bit of trust that's hard to build when we're a bit bigger. Like um, you know, 80 percent, 90 percent of the staff that we have, and I'm sure it's the same more or less everywhere else, uh, are incredibly trustworthy. You know, they're at work doing their hours, usually extra, they work hard, our team are amazing, but there's always 10% that aren't, or they're a bit lazy, or they're, you know, not heart's not really in it, or they're doing something else, you know, and that 10% make it really hard as, like, a leader to go, like, well, what if they're doing it as well? Um, there's nothing you do about it if I just distrust them, but, like, it's annoying when we see someone from the, like, a really good person says, you know, um, in fact, I mean, the thing that happened recently was someone was like, well, wait, why do we do time tracking? Like, we have a login thing. You come in and you say, I'm, I'm at work. That's so we can do more flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. We actually originally did a survey and people said they wanted a time tracking thing so they could track their hours. So we have that. And he was, like, pretty pissed off saying, like, oh, you know, it feels like you don't trust us, that kind of thing. And I was like, I, I, I do, but I don't trust them. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they need it and some people want it. And... Um, uh, he made a point of saying, like, oh, other AAA devs, they don't, they don't do uh, time tracking. And I was like, they do. They just do it at the door when you sign in with your card and don't tell you they're doing it. Mm. And now you have to very obviously go, tell us the time you're working, because you can't secretly do it anymore, which is a lot more passive way of doing it. Um, it was very much on the nose now. And, um, it, yeah, it's, uh, we, we're pretty lax with our, like security stuff generally, but I think... Um, there's a lot of companies that have had some really kind of archaic software going, what are you doing? Where are you working on it? And yeah. that's been interesting. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, heard some stories. It from feels people. a little bit euphemistic right yeah. there. Yeah. We, we haven't done that. <laughs> I think for me, it sort of builds back uh, to something we were talking about earlier and just building on that. It's about uh, passive decisions and active decisions. Some people are just doing things because they're doing them. Um, they've not thought about it. They've just fallen into a habit of whatever it might be. Um, but some people out there have spent the last sort of two years, especially the pandemic, figuring out what works best for them or who they are and, and building that into their sort of home space and now going back into the office. Offices, some places have not changed. They're just like, oh, it's going to be like it was in 2019. And it's like mm -hmm. the pe people have changed in that space. And for me, a big part of it is sort of accommodations for people, especially people coming from uh, different backgrounds. You know, uh, like we're talking about people who have had suffered from mental health issues and they have more awareness of that now. People who are um, neurodiverse people and how they deal with socializing and being around people in the space and people are a lot more aware of that now than they were. Um, but it's still not, a lot of workspaces are not um, fully abreast of kind of that whole situation. And the more that we are people are aware of it now, I think the more companies can reflect on how can we make this appropriate for people coming into it from all these different sort of backgrounds, all these different kind of how best they sort of fit these spaces. And I don't think that it stops people from doing, uh, working in the office or working from home, mm -hmm. but hopefully it can help us to create sort of better working conditions for all people in sort of all shapes and sizes, as it were. Yeah, I, I, I think if we're sort of, sort of <coughs> still the uh, uh, essence of the discussion down to something, I guess, um, the realities of the pandemic have forced us into uh, you know, adapting the ways that we work. And by offering that flexibility, it has thrown up um, some you know, differences in the way that people prefer to work that probably have always existed. Um, but now you know, it's, it's right that you know, we make those accommodations um, and it's, 
you know, the challenge that has always faced managers and, and bosses of how do we cater to people and how they prefer to work and how they prefer to receive feedback and how they prefer to interact with each other um, has made that much more, more pressing and more challenging. Yeah. And I guess the um, conclusion is just um, proactive communication to sort of, you know, sharpen those issues and like uh, people's awareness of those issues um, and see what accommodations can be made. Yeah? Absolutely. <laughs> um, I think we can throw open to uh, questions from the floor or questions from Twitch now. Um, I will check our chat. Um, Wolfer1000 says, great discussion. Thank you, Wolfer. Um, uh, any, please, if you'd like to raise anything, please raise your hand. Uh, yes, uh, in, the, in the middle there with the glasses. Uh, if you'd like to walk to the mic. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Hi. Um, so one of my roles is to help find placements for students. Um, and we've had pla students placing onto remote positions, but it kind of feels like they're learning how to drive automatic and not stick shift. Are there any experiences you think that they're missing by not going into the workplace, and what kind of other training do you think that we should, I should be giving my students so that they're ready to be able to work in the workplace as well? It's a really good question. Um, <laughs> it, so it was the first thing that everyone in my position was worrying about when we went to work from home, bar maybe security kind of stuff. But um, the seniors largely can work from home. Like their problems like put your kid down, you're working. The juniors miss out on, we kind of coined it like passive learning. Like you can't walk past their screen and just see them like completely destroying the game. Like they, <laughs> they just do it now. Um, and uh, they miss out on those conversations that happen in the office. And so we were like, okay, we need all the juniors to be in the office. De definitely I'll be there. So you bring all the juniors to the office. And then obviously what happens is you've got none of the seniors coming into the office. So the juniors are just there, just like preschool, like <laughs> destroying the game as a group now. But um, I don't have an answer on what that solution is. Uh, going to the office and uh, making sure there's some kind of seniors there in some capacity. Yeah, if I was a junior, I wouldn't actually look for, uh, graduating from university or an intern, I, I would try and get to an in-studio role. I would, that would be my advice to an intern. Like, you can apply for those bigger studios remote stuff, it will be harder. Like, I'm sure they're all fed up of online learning at university. <laughs> Why do they think that's any different in a studio? Yeah. Um, you're professional teachers, we're not, so we were even worse than you at it, but we can go. I think from my perspective, uh, so we've just recently taken on uh, two people through the Kickstart scheme, and the thing that I've seen in that has been, uh, and I've seen it before in other places, is that sometimes students are not, sometimes people, they have it naturally, but sometimes they're not great at proactively communicating with the people around them. They're not good, they, they get a sense of fear of like, oh, am I not quite doing this right? I'll just carry on. They don't actually go and say to the manager, oh, hey, can I check this with you? They don't um, proactively talk to the team. And obviously, everybody there, all, the, all their seniors, their bosses, their managers, everyone wants them to perform well. That's why they brought them on. They, they think they've got lots of potential. Um, and the problems come when they hide from that situation. They think, oh, I'll just make it work, I'll make it work, and then end up destroying the game. Um, so for me, it's that level of, it, it's a level of communication. And especially when it's remote, it, you have to almost double or triple down on that and be like more actively just like, oh, hey, you know, I think this is it. You know, even if it's just passive, like just posting little like clips and saying, oh, this is what I did today, you know, screenshots, something that doesn't have to be interacted with, but just keeping people generally aware of what's going on. Because exactly like as Joe was saying, you can't, there won't be that walk by, there won't be that just like being able to, to cast a casual eye over it. There will be that sense of separation. So you have to more actively try and make that connection by going, oh, hey, this is how it's been going, and make sure that, that everyone's aware of it, because then that will catch issues, or not even issues, just things that are worth talking about sooner than if they were just left until, you know, a review a month later. I do think there's less that the students can do, though. I think it is largely on us to, to solve those problems. Oh, like, yeah, for sure. Yeah, asking, that's a great <laughs> answer, really, for what the students can do is ask questions and be loud and say, say when you've got a problem. Like, I don't know of any senior lead that's gone like, oh, for God's sake, he's, this junior's brought me a problem. Oh, man. <laughs> that's like, doesn't really happen. So yeah. just, just speak. That's the best advice I can get, really. Awesome. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, feels like this is a really good practical discussion. Yes, sir, you, sir. Um, Mike. Hi. Apologies if, if you said this at the beginning and I missed it. Question for Joe. You mentioned that you were working on your own projects, but also um, 
outsource work for hire for a AAA project. Uh, so when you went for the trial of four day weeking, four, four day week working, you know, did you discuss that with your client? I imagine so. Um, but you know, how did that go? And, and sort of how is it structured? It's sort of milestones of work being delivered and stuff like that. I just wondered how that went. Thank you for the easy question. Um, <laughs> hmm, it's on Twitch, isn't it? It is, yeah. Great, great. Um, <laughs> you can always catch me afterwards. <laughs> oh, we'll have to be after for the real answer. Um, it blew up in my face. Um, and uh, we, have, we have a really, really good partner, is what I'd say. Um, yeah, that's, that's, like really, it, that's a really hard answer, honestly. Um, but um, I think with, with Balkan, who we are, because we're an indie studio who... We're doing it our way. We don't care about you. And um, we ended up getting to like 100 people working on AAA games, still being like, we didn't have a lot of this like infrastructure. We, we'd never done co development until uh, like the first lockdown. So when someone's like, um, no, you can't do that, we're like, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> that um, so there's a bit like, it was a bit interesting. But what I would say is, um, the if you have like an output based contract right it doesn't really matter and that slower project we do have an output based contract so it's kind of like <laughs> really, like we're, yeah. we're good well you're getting the output like what do you care if the hours are done and i think that largely is the point so if you've got a contract with a certain amount of hours then that's kind of bad for everyone really like do you care if i'm sat at my desk or do you care if you get the work um and i think that's way better that incentivizes us and the staff and they can understand that but um, the larger problem is that there's multiple teams working on one game, and one of those teams is doing four days. Um, but I'd argue that my people are faster. Um, we have been because we're indie, because we've got a month left to make a game on no money. So accidentally, we're faster naturally. But um, yeah, it's, it, it, um, we're, we're lucky to have the partners we have. Uh, there was plenty of people who would have just said no and fired us straight away. But um, hey, if you're in the games industry and you're trying to hire right now, it's it's hail mary time. That's like, it's tough. So um, yeah, that's that's one of the main reasons for doing it. So, yeah, awesome. Cool. Um, I think that if, unless there's any more questions from the audience, I'll I'll, I'll follow up briefly on that. Like, um, how do you? What's what exactly is your measurement of productivity? I'm sure this is an easy question for you to answer, but it's not it's not immediately clear to me. Um, how, how, how you compare like the work that gets done after a change to that versus the work that got done ahead of it, and like do you know they're comparable? Like do you know for sure you're at ninety percent or eighty percent of what you were? Um, honestly, it's really hard. Um, we looked at lots of um, ways of tracking uh, what you're doing. Um, you know, a lot of bigger studios will do. Uh, time tracking on per task, and that's usually how you calculate whether you should release DLC or not, and whether you should push or pull, and or increase marketing spend and all that stuff. We don't do any of that because it slows us down. We just do it and mm -hmm. say we need to get all this stuff done by here. Here's all the stuff. Let's kind of do it, and then true agile development really. And um, we actually rephrased our own one and called it chaos because it's really chaotic. What that means is that basically we can't track that, that though. But what we do know is our partner, you know, guy asked about. Um, they haven't had anything late. If anything, they get things early. So um, we actually started with, like, we'll start with this small group, like the character art team, I think it was. Uh, so that's really easy to measure. Characters take X weeks, and they really, and that done, Got really easy. Art, a lot easier. Programming on the more problem solving side of stuff. Mm. Yeah, if you ask a programmer how long a task's gonna take, it's gonna be for anywhere between a week and a year. Yeah. Um, so you just kind of lean into it. and. Um, I'd say that largely the, um, you know, you know it, it, it's pretty, uh, what's the word, sorry, when you, we, you know, we're not, we're not guessing, but sentiment basically is what we're going off of. So the real metric for us, for the four day work week being a success, is if we can hire a better standard and more people. Um, you know, are we, we're not gonna, we're never gonna get faster, we are going to be slower, just throw that out the window straight away. Are we going to be slower to a point where we can't make a game? No, I think we're, we're kind of proving that's fine. We're still on that test, but largely it's okay. And the real test is, are we getting in better quality of applicants, and are we getting in more of them? If that's the case, while no one else is doing a four-day work week, 
then we're winning because those people are faster generally and are better and the quality goes up. We can charge more for games. We can make more money, blah, 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 blah. So I think um, it's almost, uh, at least in the games, a creative industry, do you care if you're slower? Mm -hmm. And stop writing articles about how the four-day work week makes you more productive because you're just fucking lying. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> All right. I mean, that, yeah, like that's, I think there's clearly a lot to learn it's, I mean, as you mentioned there, it's a, it's a, it's a candidate's market right now in, in, in game dev. And prob it's, we've heard all these other stories about the great resignation and things. It seems like that's something that's happening worldwide. So hopefully, maybe, uh, people can take the four-day four work we come more seriously for that reason. Um, well, I think we'll, we'll have to wrap it there. But you know, thank you guys so much for coming for your time. I think a really insightful, hopefully useful conversation. Coming up next here in the PC Games 10 Theatre, we've got um, Ensemble by the London Games Festival. Uh, Ensemble is their um, outreach initiative. It's going to exist to uh, spotlight the work of uh, underrepresented uh, developers uh, in and around London. So do stick around for that. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you guys again very much. And let's have a round of applause, please. Thank you.